Hello guys, um, good afternoon to all of you. So uh, in this series of lectures, we have, uh, we have been discussing about operating systems and in the previous lecture we discussed about the, uh, an introduction, we uh, discussed, uh, had an introduction to this operating systems and we discussed about what is an operating system, its basic concepts, we discussed about some terms and we discussed about the evolution of operating system, different types of operating systems and all. And uh, in this session, we are going to discuss about processes and threads, okay? So, um, before that, I want to uh, quickly remind you of some uh, points. So, we have this plus subscription. Uh, if you go to an academy plus, you have a lot of live courses available there. You can enroll to these courses at a very small amount and it will be very helpful to you. We have amazing educators there. So it will be very helpful. So, um, and more than that, uh, now we have introduced the plus subscription. So these plus courses will be very long, like uh, it will be uh, mostly for, for many months and also you can uh, have um, six months or one year subscription, then you can see all the courses for free. So uh, make use of it. So back to our session, we are going to discuss about processes and threads. So first of all, before we discuss about these, um, processes first we need to discuss about program so what is a program basically it's a set of instruction and it is passive or non lively see if you have a, a, a set of you write a c program here like hash include stdio.h you write the main function and you write like a print of hello world and you uh, end the um, program now that is what that is a program it's a set of instruction right so that is a program and uh, it is passive it has no life it, it's a program that is what we call a program it's a set of instruction and it has a long lifespan and it is stored in disk see uh, this will be stored in the secondary memory we call uh, secondary memory right uh, it's disk means what secondary memory okay so it has long lifespan, we'll discuss about that now. So that is a program, it's a set of instruction. You write a C program, like you have uh, some lines of code. So that code is what a program. Now when you go and execute that code, when you execute that program, then it is called a process, okay? So uh, we have what we have um, a process uh, can be defined as a program in execution, okay? so a when a program is executed, we call it what a process. So when a program uh, runs, it is called the process. So you have what you have your C program here. You have the code. You have the uh, header files include. You have the main function. You have some printf statements. And when you run it, you'll get what the output, right? So when a program is run, it is called the process, and it has life and it is called active. So a program is a passive entity, and a process is what an active entity. Okay. Then it is stored in RAM. See, um, F, as we discussed, a program, a program uh, is stored in secondary memory, and a process is stored in. Sorry, uh, a, a program is uh, stored in secondary memory. See, when you have a program, when you write a program. Uh, when you write a C program, it will be stored in where in your secondary memory, you can always access it and all. But when a program is executed, it is uh, stored in where when it is being executed, it is stored in um, primary memory or we call it what the RAM, right? So um, that is uh, the difference between program and process. A program is a set of instruction. When it is executed, we call it a process. And why do we say that it has a long, this program has a long lifespan and um, uh, why we say process is having a, a smaller lifespan. See, a program when written and saved, it can be there in your secondary storage for a long time. So when you delete it or when it is um, deleted, it is gone from the uh, secondary memory, right? So it can be there for a long time. But what about process? When you write this program, when you open it, when you execute it, that will be, uh, it will be uh, executed uh, and uh, after some time, it will be completed, right? It will complete its execution. So only while it is being executed, it is stored there. So we can say what? It has a smaller lifespan, okay? So these are the basic differences between a program and process. A program is a set of instruction. It is passive entity. And when it is executed, it is a process. And it has what? It is an active entity. And it has, process has a, a smaller lifespan where program has a long lifespan. And programs will be always stored in where secondary memory. Processes will be stored in where 
main memory or random access memory okay now that we have learned what a process is we can discuss about what a thread okay so both this process and thread is what they are the units of execution okay so a program in execution is called a process it is active and lively okay then what is a thread a thread is the smallest unit of processing or execution so we can say both process and thread are what um, units of execution and a thread is the smallest unit of execution okay and it exists within a process now that is important so you have a process here okay so uh, inside threads exist within process inside the process there will be threads okay and a thread is often called as a lightweight process or a subset of process okay now it is actually kind of similar to process it's also a unit of execution but it exists within this processes okay Next, uh, there can be uh, single threaded processes and multi threaded processes. See, uh, this is a process and this is a thread. So, if you have just one thread in your process, then such processes are called what single threaded process. And if you have multiple threads, here we have three threads in the process, right? So, such processes are called what multi threaded processes. Okay, note, uh, and we have something. Uh, important a process may contain one or more threads but a thread cannot contain a process so never confuse between that uh, a process is what this is a process and within process we have threads so it can have one or more threads but a thread cannot have a process sometimes uh, a process is referred to as what thread also because uh, if you have a process it and see this point is also important a process contain at least one thread so every process will contain at least one thread okay so every process if you take it it will have at least one thread so for some single threaded processes we can call it as thread also okay so, so a process can be sometimes um, thread also but a thread is never equivalent to process okay so if you have just one uh, thread in your process that um, process can be called as a thread also okay since it is having only one thread is that clear okay next um, these are the uh, now using this figure you can clearly understand the difference between single threaded and multi threaded processes now this is a single threaded process and it is having just one thread here and it has what registers stack code data files so for this as we said this is like a process it also executes so it requires what it requires some uh, resources for execution right it requires memory it requires some code it requires the other resources it requires uh, CPU time and all so it, it has it is it is like a process and it needs rec uh, this resources and um, now when you see the multi-threaded process you can understand something more clearly see we have three threads here one two and three now this first thread is having what stack and registers and then the second one is also having stack and registers and third one is also having what stack and registers okay so what you can understand from here is that every thread has its own stack and its own registers okay it has its own stack and its own registers and that is really important you get questions from that a lot so uh, every thread maintains its own stack its own registers but this code data files these all are shared see if you have a process that process will get what some resources to execute right it will get some resources to execute like it will have its code it will have data it will have files it will get its cpu time it will get its memory it will get its um, like uh, like address space and all right so uh, that most of the resources is actually given to what process separately processes are what independent okay we can call a process independent so they uh, actually run as independent entities okay so they get what separate resources to execute and what happens these threads inside this process see we will have threads inside the process they'll share most of the resources that uh, is allocated to a process a process will get some resources and threads inside that process share that resources but a thread every thread has its own stack and registers it never share what stack and registers okay they have it, their own stack and registers now that is really important 
then threads share the resources allocated to the process including address space now that is also important every process has its own address space so uh, let's say we have this process p1 and we have this process p2 so this process will have its own address space it will be running in its own address space now we have the next process that will also run in its own address space okay so every process has has their own what address space okay but what about threads threads actually share this address space of process so uh, these uh, threads will be inside what they, they exist within the process right so they actually share this address space given to what process okay so that is important threads ha uh, do not have their own address space they uh, they really uh, share it okay So uh, they share the address space. Next, uh, let us discuss about what multi-threading. So what is multi-threading? See, when multiple threads are running concurrently, they, it is called multi-threading. So we'll have a lot of uh, threads uh, inside this process, right? So when they run in parallel, we can call it what multi-threading. So uh, for example, let's say uh, an example, downloading um, a video while playing it at the same time. Okay, uh, downloading a uh, video while playing it is an example for what is an example for multi-threading. See, uh, that's the same process, right? Actually, we are downloading this file. But while it is downloading, we can play it also. So, you must have noted this. You must have been um, doing this. You must be familiar with the situation. You can download a, a file and at the same time, you can do what you can... Uh, play it also you can download a music and at the same time before it completes the downloading uh, you can play it so what is that it's actually different threads of the same process executing okay so that's uh, called what multi-threading so these threads can run in parallel okay so that is called multi-threading and see another example let's say like um, you have what you have uh, you have your word pad and you're typing something there and uh, while you are typing it, while you are editing this file, it is automatically saved, right? Even if you are not saving it uh, frequently, it's actually saved. We have automatic saving there. So while you are editing, it's actually saved in the background. So that's also what different threads executing of the same process. So uh, such uh, happening, such uh, a situation is called what multi-threading. So these threads, multiple threads run concurrently, okay? Next we have what? Uh, two types of threads so we can say we have two types of threads which are what user level threads and uh, kernel level threads okay so first we have user level threads and user level threads are implemented by the user and it requires no hardware support so it's actually very easy to implement and uh, it's very easy to implement it's easy to manage and all but it is actually implemented by whom it is implemented by the user user level threads are created or implemented by users and it requires no hardware support it's not that complicated uh, it can be easily um, managed it requires no hardware support and os has no idea of existence of user level threads so let's say we have this um, process and we have what we have some user level threads there okay let's say we have four threads here so OS do not have an idea of existence of these threads OS don't know kernel doesn't know what the existence of these threads but it's not like uh, a kernel is not even uh, taking care of it it's not even looking at it it's like um, there is lack of caring there lack of um, support from the kernel okay it's not supporting as whole but definitely it requires kernel support for execution okay it, it requires kernel support but it don't know that these many threads are here there are some user level threads here it actually takes uh, it, it, it actually considered this whole as a single thread okay it don't know that these many user level threads are existing but for like every process will have what every process will have what one at least one thread right so it actually considered this process as a, a single threaded process okay it considers this process as a single threaded process and that much um, care or support is given to the process okay so OS has no idea of existence of the user level threads and it considers the user level threads as a single threaded process. Okay. Now, if one user level thread is blocked, entire threads are blocked. So if this one thread is blocked, what happens? Entire thread will be, entire threads will be blocked or this process will be blocked. And why is that? 
because we know that we require what kernel support right for execution so when one thread is blocked what is really happening as we said a kernel only knows what it, it do not know like it is um, there are um, four threads here it only knows that it is a single threaded process so when one thread is blocked n there will be blocked there will not be any more support given to that process so n there thread will be threads will be blocked if one is blocked so that is a major disadvantage of user level thread and what is the advantage it's very easy to implement and it is like um, it is easy to manage and it um, it requires no hardware support and all and one more advantage for user level thread is that context switching is faster see what is context switching see uh, when a thread is being executed um, so let's say this is uh, being executed now now another thread comes another thread comes of high priority now this must be uh, gone out of the cpu in order to execute this new thread okay so uh, this actually one thread was executing and now that will be gone out and we take the new thread for execution now that is called what context switching we are going to discuss about that in detail okay so um that is um that is context switching we are going to discuss about that and uh, it's faster in user level threads why because we don't have that much information to be saved and all so uh, that is faster so that was user level threads and now we have what kernel level threads it is implemented by the kernel so uh, in user level threads it was uh, implemented by the user and now this is implemented by whom it is implemented by kernel and it requires hardware support and full kernel support is given for that full hardware support uh, is given for that and then we have what sorry full kernel support then if one kernel thread blocks other threads can still continue execution so one is if one is blocked the next thread will will be scheduled and that can execute so there is no such issues happening here because kernel knows everything about it it manages uh, everything it, it keeps a track of every thread it keeps track of every information about that thread so it is very easy even if one thread is blocked the other threads of the process can execute so if you have this process and let's say you have uh, a number of threads inside this process and let's say uh, this particular thread was executing and it, it was blocked now what happens uh, the other threads can uh, can be scheduled by the kernel and they can execute okay so there, there is no such issue because kernel gives full support to it okay and as we said uh, it, it it keeps every information it, it will be having what every information stored so what happens context switching becomes slower so that is one major disadvantage of what kernel level threads and uh, we're going to discuss about context switching then it uh, will discuss about this uh, kernel level threads context switching and user level thread context switching also okay so that was the two types of um, two types of threads user level thread and kernel level thread and let's just uh, revise it user level thread implemented by user it requires no hardware support or is does not know the existence of these threads and if one is blocked entire threads will be blocked and context switching is faster these are the important points okay then also you get questions from uh, this topic so that is uh, important okay then kernel level threads uh, implemented by kernel it requires hardware support and full kernel support is given so that even if one is um, blocked the other threads are not blocked they can continue execution and context switching is slower okay next we have what process state diagram or we call it what process life cycle so when a process is created it goes uh, like uh, into many states it it grows in many state it it has different um, states in its life cycle so that is process state diagram okay we have um, five major states for a process in its life cycle first is new then we have ready then we have running then we have terminated and then we have waiting so what is new see um, it's very easy actually when a process is created what happens see let's say we are um, we have a program and then what happens uh, we just execute that program now a process is created right what is a process again it's a program in execution when a program is executed that becomes a process so when a process is created it is in what it is in new state it's a new process okay it's like a child it's a process so uh, now every process requires what different uh, resources for execution it requires uh, memory and everything so uh, when it is ready for execution we call it what uh, it gets all the um, 
resources needed for execution let's say we need some io devices and we need some other uh, files to be opened we need some data from that files so processes different processes have what different demands different needs for execution so when it is allocated with all the resources what happens it uh, it can be executed it is ready for execution but that is also not enough uh, for a um, for a, a process to be executed it requires to be uh, brought into main memory so uh, we have what we have the disk we have the secondary memory and we have the main memory so programs are stored in secondary memory we discussed about that right programs will be stored in secondary memory and um, when it is executed it is actually brought into main memory so it has to be brought into main memory and then uh, it, then only it is executed okay and it requires what cpu so if you have just one cpu in your uh, computer so it's a uniprocessor system you have just one cpu and uh, a, a, only one process can be executed at a time right only one process can be executed so what happens uh, if, uh, first a process is created then it is allocated with all the resources then it is brought into main memory it is brought into main memory from there it is given cpu and when it gets cpu it it will start its real execution and that is called what running state okay so first a process is created that is in what new state and when it gets all the resources and when it is uh, brought into main memory then it is in ready state okay and from ready state it will be given cpu so when it is a uh, given cpu it, it it goes into running state so there will be sh so uh, there will be what a uh, different processor there will be number of processors waiting for execution there will be a lot of process in ready state okay so uh, a scheduler will be there and scheduler will do what select one process for execution and dispatcher is there dispatcher will give what cpu to that process okay and so it's like a process is created and then it is uh, allocated with all the resources and it is brought into main memory okay now from there uh, there will be a lot of uh, processes waiting in the main memory see let's uh, okay so uh, let's say we have what we have this main memory here and there will be a number of process so first of all every process is created and uh, when it is allocated with all the re resources and it, if it is ready for execution it will be brought into main memory and there will be a number of processes waiting for cpu here okay when it is ready for execution it only requires cpu right and there is this cpu and it can execute only one process at a time so scheduler will come and it will choose one process for execution and dispatcher will come and it will give cpu to that process and it will get executed okay that is what really happens and um, so that was new state ready state and running state so when cpu is given we can call it what running state and uh, after it completes the execution it will go to terminated state okay so uh, that is the normal uh, life cycle of a process that's a normal life cycle uh, first a process created it is allocated with all the resources it is brought into main memory from there it is given cpu then it completes execution and goes to terminated state but uh, there is this one more uh, state which is waiting so when it is being executed it requires some more resources it is waiting for some io to be released or some uh, io to be allocated or some event happens or it is waiting for some io device it's it cannot execute right so uh, when a process requires some io device and it is not uh, allocated to it then what happens it will go to waiting state it cannot be what it cannot be waiting in running state because in running state a cpu is given to process right and cpu it's like cpu cannot be idle so a process cannot be inside or cannot be allocated with cpu and it is not being executed that is what that is too expensive right cpu must be executing uh, processes and it must not be idle okay so that is uh, important so uh, a process um, if it is uh, waiting for some event to occur it wait it goes to waiting state and some other process can be selected from ready state and given cpu okay so that process can execute 
Now, when it uh, its uh, wait is completed, when it gets that IO or when uh, that event is completed, then it can go back to ready state. And from there, again, scheduler comes, select one process, and it is given CPU. And then it can go to what running state. Okay. Now, uh, so we discussed about that. Uh, discussed about. Okay, just um, let me erase this. Okay. Now, we discussed about this tran transition, right? It's what from a new uh, state when it is given all, when it is allocated with all the resources, it will be what? It will be um, gone to ready state, right? And when it is uh, brought into main memory, it is in ready state. That's this transition. And then what is this transition? It's scheduler comes, scheduler process, dispatcher gives the uh, CPU to that process, then it goes to execution. That is this transition. And when it completes execution, this is that transition. It goes to terminated state. And then we have what? When it waits for some event to occur, it goes to uh, a process while executing. Uh, it, it, it is waiting for some event to occur, it goes to waiting state. That is this transition. And when it uh, completes that event, when it gets that IO, then what happens? Uh, it goes to ready state from waiting state. Now, there is one transition that we didn't discuss, which is what this one. So, what is that? So, it is from, it, that transition is from where? It's from running state to it is from running state to ready state, right? So it is like when a process uh, is created and then it goes to ready state and from there, scheduler comes, schedule that process, dispatcher comes um, and gives CPU to that process, it goes to running state, right? So this process went to running state. So let's say it's P1. So P1 is currently running here. Now what happens? Another process of high priority, let's say P2, that's another process, P2 comes here, to ready state so there will be a lot of process in ready state right so that's another process coming p2 is coming to the ready state and it is waiting there in the main memory for cpu and it is of high priority now what happens an interrupt will be um, uh, sent and what happens this process p1 is executing right but p2 is of high priority that must be executed first so before p1 completes execution it is sent back to what it is sent back to ready state so that this P2 can be sent to running state. This is what, this is a uniprocessor system and it can, this processor can execute what only one process at a time. So uh, what will happen, this P1 must be sent back to ready state and P2 will be sent to running state. Now that is called what, this transition, okay, that is this transition. So I hope it is clear. So uh, what is, um, oh, so that's that event. So uh, if an interrupt is occurring, there, uh, there must be this transition, okay, that there must be this switching, okay. Now, let us discuss about uh, process layout in memory. So, uh, as we discussed, we discussed about what pros programs, processes and threads, right? And we said that uh, programs will be stored in where it will be stored in um, secondary memory. It is having long lifespan and all. And process, uh, we discussed that it has its own virtual address space. It has its own address space, right? So every process uh, has its own address space. You take a process P1, it has its own address space. And you take a process P2, it has its own address space. So every process has its own address space and it is actually divided into what? Into four sections, which are stack, heap, data and text or code section. So we have stack section, heap section and data section or code section. Okay, we have four parts here. So uh, let us discuss about each part in detail. So first let us start from this text or code section. So what will you have in your text or code section? The executable code, right? So as we discussed, if you write a program, if you write a C program and when you execute it, what happens? Uh, the compiler will come and uh, the object file will be created, right? That object file will be here in this code section. When a process is getting executed, process is what it's a program in execution so it needs what this object code right it needs this object code so that will be stored in the code section or uh, text section okay and it is shared and it is read only so uh, if you have a multi-threaded process see you you have this process p1 and uh, you have multiple threads here 
so uh, all these threads must be needing what they must be needing this code right so it is uh, it may be shared between these uh, threads and all and it is read only so uh, no modification must be made to this code so uh, it prevents any accidental modification because it is what it is read only file okay it's a read only section so that is text or code section we have what we have the uh, object code there and uh, it is shared among these threads and it is read only okay then we have what then we have the data section so what is data section see it contains the global variables static variables and also um, in a program there will be what there will be this variables declaration and all so there will be what there will be um, uh, static variables and global variables and all so such uh, variables are stored in where that will be stored in the data section okay that will be stored in data section and data section is actually uh, divided into two types we have the um, uninitialized data section and initialized data section so this uninitialized data section is sometimes called what bss okay uh, it's called bss also so uh, we have um, data section divided into two uninitialized and initialized initialized means you have the uh, it contains the global variables or static variables which are initialized by the user and if it is not initialized that will be in this bss section and it will be um, automatically initialized towards zero there will be given the initial value zero automatically okay so that's the uh, two uh, sub sections of data section so we discussed about two sections text and uh, data section so what is text or code section you have the object file there it is shared and it is read only because no modification must be made see uh, we have what we have this code and if uh, one process comes and what happens if one process comes uh, sorry one thread comes uh, and modify it so that's not affordable right that cannot be happen that cannot be um, that should be prevented so that is why it is kept read only no modifications uh, should be made there can be made there okay so that's text or code section then you have data section we have initialized and uninitialized and uh, in, in initialized we have global static variables initialized there and you have uninitialized section where you have the uninitialized uh, variables that is static and global variables okay so these are the two sections these are some two sections uh, of uh, a process in memory and then you have what heap section okay let me erase this um, so we have what we have the heap section next so we discussed about these two sections next you have heap section so why do you need this heap section it is for dynamic memory allocation and what is dynamic memory allocation see you must have um, used this uh, mloc cloc realloc uh, free and all right that is dynamic memory allocation so when you um, like you can write programs in two ways uh, using static memory allocation and using dynamic memory allocation so if you write like uh, int a so uh, an integer variable a will be created and it will have its fixed memory right if you create an array of 10 so you create int a of 10 then it will have what it can store 10 integers in it so that's fixed so if you uh, just give uh, five way five integers into this array the remaining five um, spaces remaining five the space of remaining five integers is what it's wasted right and if you uh, have uh, array of 10 declared and you want to store what uh, 15 integers into it what happens it's not uh, enough there is no sufficient memory for that so that is the problem of static memory allocation so you can do what you can um, use dynamic memory allocation where uh, when a program is running you can give what memory on its demand when memory is needed it will be allocated that is dynamic memory allocation okay so for dynamic memory allocation we actually use the we actually use the data from heap section okay so i hope it is clear so if you write uh, we have these commands we have these uh, functions mloc cloc and all for allocating memory uh, at runtime so if you write like mloc of uh, 10 then what happens 10 units of memory will be allocated it will be given from which section this heap section okay 
so like that and if you uh, free now um, there is one more thing there is one more uh, function called free right so if you have free then what happens this allocated dynamically allocated memory will be freed so that 10 uh, units of memory will be given back to heap section okay so that's heap section and then you have what stack section so what is stack section it contains the temporary data like return address function parameters the local variables and all so um, where are these static and global variables stored in the data section right and you have local variables also so if you uh, declare these variables inside a function uh, its scope is limited to that function such functions are, sorry such um, variables we call it what local variables so such variables will be stored in this stack section and you will have functions right you will be passing parameters to this function there will be return uh, return address there will be return data that all will be such temporary data will be stored in stack section okay so these are the four sections of this process so we discussed about uh, text or code section where there is object file, data section where you have static and global variables, then you have heap section for dynamic memory allocation, then you have stack for temporary data. So simply we can define like that. And if you see you have this arrow mark here and you have this arrow mark here, why is that? Because this uh, section, data section and code section is having what? Fixed size uh, memory. So the, these um, sections are of fixed size. And uh, what about heap and stack? They can grow or shrink. And it, it's uh, depending on the demand, they can grow or shrink. Okay, it's uh, the size of these sections can be changing. Okay, so a stack can grow downwards and a heap can grow upwards. And why is it not like a heap is here, it's going upwards and stack is here, it is also going upwards. Why is it, why? are they in a growing in opposite directions it's because if they are growing in the same direction then what can happen this can overlap right they can overlap here so that to avoid that situation we have uh, designed it in uh, such a way that they grow in opposite directions okay so uh, when you when you uh, like um, allocate or when you write malloc of 20 then 20 units of memory like maybe 20 bytes of memory will be given from heap section and uh, let's say this is only uh, 20 bytes here and uh, we are allocating 25 bytes then it will grow and it will take five more bytes from here and when free is called what happens this allocated memory will be sent back and it can be uh, getting that back and uh, that is why it will not overflow or anything okay so that's uh, four sections of process and I hope it is clear, it is important. Next we have what context switching. So what is context switching? See we discussed about that when we uh, discussed the process life cycle, right? When a process is created, uh, from when a process is created to when it terminates, we have different states. We have the new state, we have ready state, we have running state, we have terminated and we have what waiting state. So we discussed about this transition, right? We discussed about that. So when a process is being executed, so this is CPU, okay? And we have process P1 here currently executing. So when it is executing, it is in which state? It is in running state, right? It is in running state. So P1 is in running state and uh, this is CPU, okay? This is CPU and CPU can execute only one process at a time. Now what will happen? Okay, uh, what will happen, uh, let's say another process P2 is coming, it, it is in ready state, okay, so it is in ready state and uh, it comes and it is of high priority, now what happens, an interrupt will be occurred, so uh, which means what, this P2 must be executed first, it is of high priority, it must be executed first before any other process, so P1 is actually executing now, it has not completed its execution. So what happens, it, it will be sent back to ready state. P1 will be sent back to ready state and P2 will be uh, gone from ready to running state. That switching is called what? Context switching. So this is actually called what? This is called context switching. Clear? So when interrupt occurs, OS needs to change the current task after saving current context so that it can be resumed later. So see, let's say uh, we were, so we have the same scenario, P1 
P1 is executing now. Okay, P1 is executing. It is having like it has 10 instructions. Okay, it has 10 lines of code. It has to complete 10 lines of code. So let's say that it was executing the fourth uh, line of code and it completed the fourth line of code when it was sent back to uh, ready state. So it didn't complete what it didn't complete the uh, remaining six uh, lines of code right so it it stopped there it paused there right so uh, it must be saved we have to resume it later it's not like when p1 is sent back to a ready state uh, then p2 will be given cpu it will complete the execution and at, at a later point p1 will again be given cpu it will again continue execution but it, it will resume from here okay it will uh, do only uh, the remaining instruction it will execute only the remaining instruction so when it stopped uh, at fourth uh, instruction then uh, at the later point it will start from where the fifth instruction okay so to get that information an os will not be remembering all these data okay so it must be saved like um, where this process stopped and uh, what were the uh, files opened and all that kind of data will be stored which is called what context the current state of the process where it is stopped uh, which pro which instruction was executed um, last and that kind of information will be stored and that is called what this context of the process so uh, it has to save the current context so that can it can so that it can be resumed later okay so that is context switching you um, save it you stop the execution of one process save its context and uh, then resume it later so that's context switching so it's not like switching of processes but it's actually switching of cpu see processes are here and cpu time is given to these processes so let's say this was p1 and uh, CPU was given to what P1 initially and then P2 comes of high priority and interrupt occurred and this CPU is what see um, the CPU will be given to P2 okay it will be taken from P1 it will be given to P2 then after uh, P2 is completed maybe uh, P1 will be again scheduled the very next after p2 p1 will be scheduled and then um, it will continue the execution so it's actually cpu is switching between these processes okay then uh, what is this context we uh, learned that context um, must be saved uh, before um, it is sent back to ready state so uh, it, the context includes the value of CPU registers, the process state, uh, memory management information. So all such information to uh, resume it later, we'll be storing, uh, we'll be including that in the context of the process. Okay, so that's context switching. So it's actually called, it's sometimes called state save and restore. So we can define context switching as what state save and it will be restored so a process will have what state a state its current state there will be the register values there will be uh, pointers and everything there will be memory management information and all so all that things will be stored and then it will be um, loaded again and then it will be resumed later so we can say it's state save and restore okay so uh, we can define context switching as switching the CPU to another process requires performing a state save of the current process and a state restore of a different process. And um, this task is known as what context switch. So this is context switching and we discussed about context switching uh, when we discussed what this um, user level thread and kernel level thread right so here we said that context switching is faster why because it do not have its uh, the size of its context is actually very small it do not have that much information and anything so its context switching is faster because its context is small and what about kernel level thread it will have a lot of information in its context it will have all these values register values memory management information and everything so um, different pointers and everything so its context is very large so it has to save that context then uh, restore it so it takes much of time for this state saving and restoring so that is why context switching is slower here it takes more time than uh, in user level threads okay so um, that's important thing 
then we discussed about this uh, definition of uh, context switching, switching the CPU to another process, okay. Now we said that its context will be saved. So where is it saved? A process when in execution is uh, sent back to ready state, it will be having, when it is context switched, what happens? Its uh, state will be saved. So where is it saved? It's saved in process control block. We have PCB. So let us discuss about this PCB here. So what is PCB? PCB is process control block or we can call it what task control block. So simply it's a data structure. It's a data structure. It's like a table that we have. There will be a lot of information about the process. So every process will have what every process uh, in our system will have this PCB associated with it. So each and every, so let's say we have 1 million pro uh, processes in our system, then it will have 1 million process control blocks also. Okay, so every process will have their own process control block and every information about this process will be saved in process control block. So let us see um, which are the information that are stored in process control block. So we have what, we have the pointer. So this pointer, it's a stack pointer. It is like, as we said, if you have 10 instruction, you stop that word, you stop that third instruction then pointer will be pointing to that position, okay? Now it tells us uh, what is the position of the process now, okay? What is the current state of the process? Where it stopped the execution? So that is pointer. Then you have process state. So we discussed about different states of a process. We have new, ready, running, and you have a terminated and waiting state. So in which state the process is right now? That will be stored in this field. You'll have the process state. And then you have process number or ID. So every process, actually, we uh, discussed what in the previous uh, lecture, we discussed about the functions of operating system that we said that it keeps track of every process. It knows every process uniquely, right? So every process uh, in a system can be identified uniquely using an identification number here. So every process has what a unique ID. So just like uh, in your college, you'll have what an ID number that will be unique, right? So just like that in a system, every process will have what have an ID number. So that's process number or ID. It's a unique identification number. Then you have what process control, uh, sorry. Pro, uh, we have a PC, program counter, sorry, it's program counter, okay? So what is program counter? It's a register and what will uh, it have? It's an important register. It will have the uh, address of next instruction to be executed. See, let's say that we have um, this program here and you have one, two, three, four, five, six, or some uh, 10 instructions, okay? Let's say it has uh, 10 instructions to execute and let's say it is executing this instruction right now and it is at address 1000. Okay, it's at, it is at address 1000. And now the next instruction to execute is which one? This one, right? So it will be at address, it will be at some address and let's say it is at 2000. So in program counter, you will have the value or you will have the address of next instruction to be executed. So uh, if this is the scenario in your program counter, which value will be stored? 2000. So it, this, um, instruction is currently executed and now the next instruction to be executed is this one and it is at address 2000. So in program counter you will have the value of next instruction to be executed and that is very very useful uh, in this context switching and all and when you resume the program or the sorry the process later then what happens it is uh, this address of the next instruction to be executed will be taken from what the program counter okay. So it's like that. Then you have the register, so there will be a uh, register, so you'll have the general purpose register, you'll have the accumulator, base register, index register and all here. And then you have memory limits, so what are memory limits? Like the memory uh, related information will be here, like uh, what is the value of limit register, what is the value of base register, that information will be there. Like if you have a, pro a process, um, it will be given what some memory, right? It will be given some address space. So where it is starting, that is the base register value. So the base register will have that value where it is, where it is starting in the address space. And what is the length of it? Like if it is 20 bytes, that will be stored in the limit register, okay? So these information will be in memory limits field and you will have the page table or segment table and all. 
So you'll have that information. And then you have what list of open files. So when a process is executing, it might need uh, data or information from uh, different files, right? So it may be, um, it, it may open some files and uh, while it's execution. So that details will be here in this field. And then you have what other miscellaneous information, which includes the accounting information, which includes the IO status information and scheduling information and all. So what is accounting information? See uh, how much uh, time is needed, how much time it uh, executed in CPU, how much uh, time is um, required more. So, so that kind of information will be here in accounting information. Then you have IO status information. So uh, which IO is needed, which IO was used. So that related information will be here and uh, scheduling information. So uh, scheduling information is like, as we said, uh, when a process is coming, like uh, when a process is executing, another process of high priority comes like, uh, then it, it gets context switched and all. So every process will have its own uh, scheduling parameters, its own priority and all. So if a process is of high priority, that information will be here in scheduling information field, okay? So uh, all information related to this process will be where it will be here in the process control block. So when context switching happens, uh, what is really happening? Say uh, we have what we have the, so every process have what their process control block, right? So we have what P1, this is the process control block of P1. Then you have what, then you have P2. And it is also having what its process control block. So let's say P1 is currently executing. So what happens? It's this process control block will be loaded. Okay. Then uh, it, it is executing now. And let's say P2 and interrupt comes and P2 must be executed next. So what happens? It will be released and uh, P2's uh, process control block will be loaded and it will complete the execution. Then this will be restored. The process control block of this one will be restored. So um, context switching actually uh, is an overhead. It's really expensive. Why is that? Because it, uh, see uh, our CPU must run very fast, right? But when a process is like context switched, uh, it, it requires time for saving the context and restoring the context. So it requires some time, right? So it's actually an overhead. So you have to uh, reduce it as much as possible, okay? Sorry, it must be uh, reduced as much as possible. It's an overhead, okay? So, uh, so in the um, so in, in uh, modern systems, what happens is that uh, it is very fast that it can like in in second in a second it can um, it can perform hundred context switches and it is very fast now, but still it's an overhead. So uh, if you can, you, you have to design the system in such a way that the context switching is taking the less time. It's the um, uh, smallest time. It is taking the smallest time possible. Okay, so um, that's uh, context switching. And uh, as we said, when context switching happens, the uh, information will be stored into this process control block and every process will have their own uh, process control block and it is maintained throughout its lifetime. So when a process is created, it will be in what? It will be new stage. From there, it will have its own uh, what? This process control block. It will keep the process control block. It will maintain the process control block throughout its um, lifetime. Okay, it will uh, maintain it throughout its lifetime. And when it is terminated, when it completes the execution and it is terminated, then what happens? This will be released. Okay, so that is process control block. And uh, similarly, we have what thread control block also. It will have what the uh, information related to thread. So it includes the thread specific information such as thread identifier. So every thread have what, every thread will have its own identification or its own identifier. So every thread in, uh, can be identified uniquely and it will have a stack pointer and it will have program counter and the same use, this uh, pointer and uh, PC is having the same use and then pointer to PCBC. Uh, every process is having what? Process control block and inside this process there will be what? Um, different uh, threads, multiple threads. So these process threads will have what? Uh, pointer to its process control block where it belongs to. So uh, they are like, uh, it's like a parent-child relationship here. 
uh, let's say this is a process and it is having a process control block and there are threads inside it so they will have pointers to this process control block okay so that will be there then thread state will be there so thread can also exist in different state it can be ready running or blocked so uh, which state this uh, thread is currently in that will be here and then you have what register value so there will be registers also so we discussed this um, see every thread is having what stack and register right so there will be registers also so uh, that is um, that information will also be here saved in the thread control block okay so um, so these are some important information about processes and threads and what what did we discuss today uh, we discussed about a program and a process so program is like uh, a a set of instruction and it is a passive entity when it is executed we call it a process and then uh, process is what it's stored in ROM and what is program it's stored in uh, secondary memory and then uh, when a program must be uh, when a program is to be executed it must be brought into main memory and uh, then we then we discussed about thread thread is like what it's a smallest unit of execution it is existing within a process then it is called lightweight process so why is it called lightweight process see a, a thread is actually requiring um, smaller number of resources compared to a process so a process is always heavy weight and a thread is always lightweight so process requires uh, more resources and separately and here thread requires a smaller number of resources and they can share it also okay so that is um, why it is called lightweight process and then we discussed about a uh, single threaded and multi threaded process then we discussed that now this is important what a thread uh, have separately and what a thread shares that's important okay so it actually now we discussed about what uh, we have um, different sections in a process right we have code section we have data section there will be files so all that will be shared among these threads and it has its own stack and registers now most importantly the address space processes have their own separate address space and uh, stack will have what it's a uh, shared address space now that is really important okay then we discussed about multi-threading when this uh, execute in parallel we call it multi-threading and uh, really good care must be taken uh, while we do what multi-threading and why is that because they can get what uh, they can modify they are using uh, or they are using the shared memory so uh, it, it must be synchronized in an efficient and effective manner okay then we discussed about user level threads and kernel level threads and then we uh, discussed about the process state diagram and the this is what this is context switching now we know what context switching is okay when a process is being executed another process of high priority comes so it must be sent back to ready state saving the context and that other process must be executed so that is context switching and it is what it is an overhead and we discussed about the process layout we have stack and heap growing the data section and code section is what fixed size and then uh, you have a uh, context switching we discussed about that and the state will be stored in where in process control block now why do we need context switching when context switching happens when you have multitasking computers like uh, multiple tasks can be executed simultaneously that requires what context switching then you have what preemptive scheduling algorithms which we are going to study in the coming lectures so um in such scheduling so actually you have lot of processes in ready state right so in ready state there will be lot of process so how to pick one from it that is scheduling so there are different scheduling schemes that operating system uses so uh, in some uh, it requires context switching so that's another thing and uh, so uh, and when and we also discussed about two modes of operation right we discussed about um, user mode and kernel mode right uh, so uh, when you switch between user mode and kernel mode there will be context switching so that is why these are some cases which requires context switching and it is an overhead okay then you have what uh, process control block we discussed about all these um, information stored here then we discussed about thread control block okay so I hope uh, today's session helped you and uh, Again, I want to tell you that please subscribe to our uh, plus courses and uh, we have monthly yearly subscription also. So uh, you can make use of it. We have amazing educators. They are taking plus courses and uh, 
you can um, enroll to these courses and it will be helpful to you. So uh, that's all and have a good day. Thank you all.